Good morning, church. Can you guys hear me okay? I, I did turn the microphone on before this time. Last time I spent the first five minutes up here messing with it, so I'm learning. Um, I will say as an aside before we get into the message today, um, my hometown is Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is where the Sight and Sound Productions are created and, and done. Um, and so I just want to kind of echo what was said in the announcements that um, if you get a chance to come out and, and to see that, or if you ever get a chance to go to Lancaster, or I think they're also in Missouri, um, go and, and see one of them in person there. It is, I mean, I'm, I'm proud and I'm biased, but it is some of the best uh, creative work that is being done in the kingdom of God in the world. Um, it is unbelievable. I've, I've served in ministry with some of the people who work there and are part of the, the teams there, and um, incredible people doing doing some awesome work for the for the kingdom, and so um, just wanted to kind of echo that and and throw that plug in there. Um, just to kind of prep you, we're going to be in the book of John today, in John chapter eleven. We're going to look at one of the I am statements of Jesus uh, today, and I think you know I was thinking about this and and kind of cycling through one that I wanted to preach about, and and I don't know about you guys, but I I feel like Sometimes it's just important for us to kind of center ourselves um, on on Jesus. There's uh, in our world today that is very hostile and very uh, divisive. Um, Jesus kind of gets used as a pawn uh, to say, "Hey, you know, I, I believe this, and Jesus believes this, and if you don't agree with me, then you don't agree with Jesus." and you know, whether whatever, regardless of your ideological position or, or theological position or political position, it, it kind of gets used in all ways. And and I feel like there's a lot of people speaking for Jesus in places and in ways in which he never spoke for himself. And so sometimes it's good for us to center on things like the I am statements that are found in the book of John, because it's just it, it's literally just Jesus telling us who he is. It's him speaking for himself, and I don't know about you, but as a, as a person that's trying to, to follow Jesus, I, I want to I let Jesus speak for himself, and then I want to base what I do and what I think off of that. So that's, that's what we're going to do today, but I, I, before we do that, I want to just pray. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a habit of mine. It's a, it's a thing I do before every sermon. I just want us to, to make sure that we're quiet with God. And let's just center our hearts and minds in this moment before we, we enter his text. So go to, go to God in prayer with me, please. Father God, thank you for today. Today is a gift. Um, every moment that you give us breath, um, God, it is your breath that you are putting in our lungs. Um, God, it is your purpose for us. It is your will for us. Um, it is your life for us, and God, it is our job just to try to steward that as well as we can. So God, I would ask this morning, um, God, you are open our, our hearts and our eyes to what you have for us in this text. God, I pray that our time together would be encouraging um, and empowering as we seek to do your will, and, and God, most of all, I pray that if there's anything in this message that's my opinion or just, God, my, my soapbox, I, I just pray that you move that aside, um, because God, we're not here today so that we can hear from me. We're here today because we want to hear from you, and so I ask that you speak to us because we're listening. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. I wanted to, to start this morning just getting your minds thinking, ha, have you ever watched a master at work? You know, I think about my, my grandfather who was a really, really good woodworker, and he had a, had a shop in their house for years, and it was amazing. You know, if I, if I needed something built when I went to college, you know, he built most of the, the stuff that wound up in my, my dorm room. If we needed something around the house, he could build it. I think he built the cabinets in my, my parents' first home. I mean, he just was a master's in, in ways that I, I'm not skilled, you know, but it was just amazing what he could do, you know, with wood and, and with tools. You know, I think about my uncle who's, uh, you know, a master mechanic, um, and just if you have any car trouble in the world, it was great because you could just take it to him, and he would spend a little time with the, 
a wrench looking under the hood, and he'd be able to diagnose what was going on and how to fix it. You know, maybe you're into to art, and so maybe you've watched someone paint that just, it was amazing what they could create, or, you know, I've, I've been to see uh, Billy Joel a couple times in, in concert, and he's just an, an amazing entertainer, an amazing songwriter. It's, it's fun to watch someone who is just a master at their craft. It, it's just kind of at a different level. It's not always something we can describe, but we know it when we see it. And I bring that up this morning because the passage that we're going to read in John 11 showcases Jesus as a master. It shows his mastery over something, and the implications of that are really, really important. So again, if you haven't already, open up to John chapter 11. I think it's also going to be on the screen. And we're going to start just by reading the first 16 verses together. John chapter 11. It says, Now a man... A uh, certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, uh, the village of, from the village of Mary and her s- sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed uh, the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. And so the sisters went to him, to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. But now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant he was taking rest and sleep. And so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so you may believe, but let us go to him. And so Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Now let's pause here for a second. We're going to come back to this text. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning, but I want to make sure we understand some context here. Um, So you have to understand that Jesus is coming to Bethany, this town Bethany, it's a small town. It's about a mile and a half from Jerusalem. It's just over the Mount of Olives. Um, And and it's important to note this because at this point in his ministry, in in kind of the timeline of Jesus' ministry and life on earth, Jesus at at this point is downright hated in Jerusalem. The religious leaders are after him as it's referenced in the text that we read. He's kind of public enemy Number one, he's made waves. He's kind of gathered people to follow him, and and they do not like what he is doing. And so coming to this region again for him is is very dangerous in and of itself. And, and, you know, when Thomas says in verse 16, let us go that we may die with him, he's really not being dramatic. There's actually a chance that Jesus and his disciples could die if they are, you know, meet up with the wrong people. I mean, up to this point, if you would go back and read earlier in the book of John, Jesus has almost been arrested twice. He's, there's been rumor of the religious leaders plotting to kill him. Um, the crowd has tried to stone him once. They've threatened to stone him. I mean, this is a very dangerous time for Jesus in going to Bethany. Uh, but it's also important that we understand that this is kind of a turning point in Jesus' ministry and in his journey. Chapter 11 brings Jesus to this region, and from this point on in his story, he's not going to leave this region. He's not really going to travel widely anymore. He's going to remain here until he goes into Jerusalem and dies. The town of Bethany kind of becomes his base of operations for the rest of his physical life. And by the way, the the events that we're reading today probably take place, uh, historical Perspective puts it somewhere between, you know, what would be the winter Hanukkah festival, 
in, in Jewish culture and Jesus' death in the spring. So when we encounter this story, Jesus has months to live. And he knows it. And he's coming with purpose into this town. He knows that the end is near for his time on earth. And it's obvious to us as we read this story, as you've read any of the Gospels, that Jesus is very close with this family. Um, and it, it makes sense because Lazarus's sisters don't even refer to their brother by name when they speak to Jesus. They just say, hey, the, the one whom you love is dead. And no one else gets that kind of treatment except for, for John um, in, in the Gospels. And you may be wondering if, if you're reading this for the first time or if you're reading this for the first time in a while, why, why does Jesus wait two days? You know, if, if I heard that someone I loved was deathly ill or was going to die or was dead, I mean, I would drop everything and I would go, right? So why doesn't Jesus do the same? It, it kind of almost seems considerate. But we have to understand, first of all, that by the time this message reaches Jesus, based on what we read in the text, Lazarus is probably already dead by the time Jesus even receives this message. But Jesus, right at the end of the passage, or right at the beginning of the passage that we read, he, he gives us an indication as to what the whole purpose of this story is. He says it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. If you want to know what Jesus' purpose is, that sums it up right there. Everything Jesus does on earth, everything Jesus says on earth, is for the glory of God. Everything that he's about, all the intentions that he has, are for God to be glorified. And he's going to use this opportunity for a dear friend. He's going to use this opportunity to showcase God's glory. So I want us to read on in, in verses 17 through 27. It says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So verse 17 there is how we know that Lazarus was already dead by the time that Jesus got this message. It's about one day's travel for, to Jesus from Bethany. Jesus then waited two days and then had one day's travel. And so by the time he gets there, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. And that, that's actually an important detail. So in, in Jewish culture, in Jewish belief, there was this widely held belief that the soul of a person when they died would kind of hover and rest above the body or around the body um, looking for life to re-enter a body again. So the fact that he's been dead now for four days, not only is, is Lazarus, according to the Jews, dead by a physical standard, he's also dead by a, a spiritual and a soul standard as well. This is, this is important for us because we're going to see later what happens and, and it's going to become even more amazing. This is one of the places in this text that reminds us that and John is just trying to beat this horse over and over and over again that, that Lazarus is really dead. He wants to make sure you understand that so that we see what Jesus does. And, and here in this passage, part of the passage, we get this I am statement. From Jesus, Jesus, in reply to Martha, and we're going to keep that conversation in mind, we're going to come back to that, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is that his words simply precede action. We're going to skip ahead to verse 38. It says, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay against it, and Jesus said, take away the stone. 
And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, thank you, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. So we already talked about the Jews having this belief that a soul would kind of hang around for three days and then depart forever. Uh, There was also this Jewish custom that on the third day they would go and visit the body to make sure that a, a person was really dead. So at this point, someone had already been to this tomb. Someone already had been to this tomb to ensure, to make sure that Lazarus was really dead a day, a full day before Jesus gets there. So Jesus is not just doing the impossible of giving life to a dead body. He was doing the double impossible of giving life to a dead body and also restoring a departed soul to that body. This is not simply a resuscitation. This is a resurrection. And in this amazing miracle, what's one of Jesus' great signs and wonders, we learn some things about him that I think ultimately impact us. So I want us to think of two truths about Jesus today and one thing we can do in light of those truths. The first thing we learned that we've kind of hinted out already is that this text shows us that Jesus is the master of life and death. Jesus is the master of life and death. We've said it already today that that it was dangerous for Jesus to even come to Bethany. His enemies would have been made aware of his arrival, but as we said, this is a turning point in Jesus' story. He is now entering for the final time the region, the area where he is going to die. His whole life has been about this and this purpose, and the end is now near. And as I think it's so fitting that as Jesus enters Judea for the last time, that as Jesus comes down you know, to the town over the hill from the place that he's going to be brutally murdered and crucified, that he performs this miracle. Because in performing this miracle, he sends a message, I think, to the kingdoms and to the, the powers of darkness. As Jesus enters the region of Jerusalem, as he marches towards his own death, which is mere months away, in raising Lazarus to, you know, to life, he is proclaiming that he is the resurrection and the life. And in doing so, he sends a warning shot to the kingdom of darkness that the Messiah is here. That you can arrest him, you can try to stone him, you can torture him, you can crucify him, you can even kill him. But it will not matter because he is the master of life and death. Before he even dies himself, Jesus shows that he has the power to raise people to life. He, he, he is giving a precursor to what he is going to do mere months later when he raises from the dead himself. And in doing that, it shows us something about him that we can apply for us because Jesus is the master of life and death. It's not, it's not just a, that, that truth is not just something way up in the sky that we can't really take tangibly, that doesn't really mean anything to us in our world today, that that truth means something for us today. It means that just as much as you trust Jesus with your eternity, you can trust Jesus with your today. If I ask for a show of hands in here and say, you know, how many people here in here believe that they're going to heaven? I'm sure all of you would raise your hands. And if I would ask you to raise your hands and say, How many of you believe that you're going to heaven based on your own merit? None of you, hopefully, would raise your hands. But if I asked you to raise your hands again and say, hey, how many of you believe that you're going to heaven because you believe in Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for you? I'm sure all of you would raise your hands. We all believe, we all trust in God for our eternity. I I, I mean, I'm just saying this. I don't don't mean this um, arrogantly or pridefully, but if I died right here on the spot, I'm splitting heaven wide open. I know that. 
Not, not because of me, not because I'm perfect, not because I'm good. I, I make plenty, I, I sin constantly. But I've trusted in Jesus for my eternity. I've trusted that the work that he's accomplished on the cross and in the resurrection is sufficient to take away my sin and my guilt so that I can be with God forever. I believe that. We all believe that. We trust God with our eternity. And yet how often in the day-to-day lives that we have do we not trust Him with today? How often when we're stressed, when we're overwhelmed, when we're tired, when we're angry, do we run to countless things to, to gossip or to slander or to alcohol or food or sex or whatever it is, whatever your vice is, how often do we run to those things for comfort, for security? How often do we run to other people who are just as messed up as us <laughs> to try to get us through things rather than relying on God? We have, we have more trust in God for the, the grandest and the biggest and the eternal. We don't always trust him with the small and the everyday. And that's kind of where Martha's at in this story. You know, Martha has this conversation with Jesus and she says, hey, I know you, I know you got, I know you, who you are, or I think I know who you are. And I know that my brother is going to raise to life, you know, in eternity. But I don't really, I, I, I don't even think that you can do this now. We shouldn't open the tomb because it's, it's smelly in there. She trusted Jesus with her eternity, but she didn't trust him today. And be, but here's the thing. Jesus is the master of life and death. Because he's the master of life and death, he's both fully present today and he is fully powerful. I, one of the things I love about this story is... is and the part of the passage that we didn't read, there's the shortest verse in the Bible. Verse 35, Jesus wept. And, you know, that was the easiest verse to memorize. I don't know if you had Sunday school, you had to memorize verses. I always wanted to memorize that one because it was really easy. But it's actually pretty powerful. Two words. Jesus knows exactly who he is. Jesus has already said that he's the resurrection and life. He goes to Bethany knowing that he is going to raise this man from the dead to bring glory to God. And as he stands there with these people that he loves, he cries. The same way you and I would cry over someone that we love being lost. The same way that we would find ourselves in a sad situation and be moved emotionally. Jesus cries. He weeps the same way we would weep. Because he's fully human. We we, we don't probably talk about the incarnation of Jesus enough, but this is... Someone standing here at the same time is both fully human and fully God. And so the human side of Jesus, the fact that he's able to be fully present in the world, the fact that he experiences life the same way we experience life, it allows him to be fully present and to sympathize, as Hebrews talks about, with our weaknesses because he was made like us. He's able to be in this moment with his friends, with the people that he dearly loves, and to cry and to be emotionally moved. But the difference between Jesus and us is that he actually has the power to do something about it. So he's fully present in the moment, but he's also fully powerful. And so Jesus has this moment where where he acts as any human would, and he cries, but then he acts as God can act, and he raises him from the dead. And I don't know about you, but in in our world, in my life, that's the kind of God that I want. I want a God who doesn't sit up in heaven, doesn't just sit there and lord over me like every other religion has a God. You know, you, you look at Greek mythology, it's all these gods sitting up here in a council just using humans as, as pawns. That's the way they view their religion. No, we have a God that came down to us. We have a God that came and was made like us, who lived like us, who cried and bled and sweat and, and lost and loved like us. He knows exactly what it is like to go through everything that we go through. And at the same time, he <laughs> at the same time he is also supremely and completely in control and powerful. And so when I talk about being able to trust God not only with your eternity but with your today, 
It's because of that. It's because, it's because he's both human and, and God. He knows what it's like to be both. And so you can't go to God and say, hey, you don't, you don't know this thing that I'm dealing with. You don't know this struggle that I'm having. He does because he's been here and he's lived as a human. But he also has the power to change it and to fix it and to make it better. He's both God and human. He's totally present and completely powerful. And therefore, you can trust him with your eternity and with your today. You know, I was thinking a lot about this, this story. Um, this, this past weekend, I had the great opportunity to go home and see one of my friends that I've known since kindergarten get married. And our families have been friends since, since that time. Um, his name's Tyler, and one of my best friends in the world, uh, married an, an awesome godly woman, and it was, it was just a great celebration. Um, but it was also sad. Um, see, Tyler's mom passed away like the last month of fifth grade. Um, she was an a incredibly healthy lady um, who just uh, had a heart attack and died um, suddenly. And um, she was best friends with my mom, so it was, it was really, really sad just for our whole family. And I'm sitting there at the wedding and, you know, seeing all my friends from high school and just having a great time celebrating Tyler and Mackenzie. And it comes time to do, you know, what you do at weddings where you have the, you know, the bride dances with her dad. And usually the groom dances with their mom. And Tyler danced with both of his grandmothers because his mom had died when we were in fifth grade. And I stood there next to Tyler's dad. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, this isn't how this is supposed to be. This is a picture of our world just not being right. Just, just not being whole. This is, this is an awesome moment. This is an awesome celebration, but it's not perfect. Because it's not eternity. It's not heaven. And until that point, we just have to deal with, with our world just being off and being wrong, and being broken, and there being situations that we don't understand. And that's why we need a God like we have. And I was reminded, I was getting ready to leave to go home, and my dad is a high school football coach in, um, in Pennsylvania, and he was having coaches over to the house to do game planning, and one of the coaches is a guy that taught me in middle school, and his son uh, overdosed on drugs a couple years ago, died. And he was asking about the wedding, and you know, he just sat there with this sadness in his eyes and said, you know, that's, that's the hardest thing for my wife and I to go to is to weddings because we know we're never going to have that with Christian. Again, I'm just reminded of the, the brokenness, right? And I feel what these people were feeling when their brother passes away, that they're, that they're just, just brokenness, there's death, there's decay. But the great thing is that Jesus is the master of all of it. He's the master of life and death. And he's able to be there in the moment with us. And he's able to cry with us in the moment and be emotional in the moment and, and, and understand and feel all the feelings that we have. But he's able to do something about it. And that's why we need to trust him, not only with what happens in the future, but with today. So that when we face moments that are broken, when we face moments when we're sad, and when we're angry, and when we're frustrated, and when the world just isn't the way that it seems, and we just get, we just, we can't wrap our, our hands and our heads around it. Why there's just so much destruction. That we can take solace in the fact that we have a God, that we have a Savior, who is the master of life and death. He's not... He's not just up there you know, leaving us to our own devices. He's present, but he's also powerful. And so what I want you to take away, and I want you to ask yourself, so we're going to get ready to, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing again. I just want to ask you today, do you trust Jesus as much with your today, with the moment by moment of what happens, as you do with your eternity?
In what areas of your life have you not surrendered to him here? Even if you've surrendered to him for your eternity. He is the master of life and death. He is totally present and he is completely powerful. And you can trust him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the fact that in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of darkness and destruction, in the midst of a world that is seemingly spinning totally out of control, none of this is a surprise to you. None of this overwhelms you. God, none of this is too much for you. That you are the master of life and death. And because of that, we know that we can trust you with all of the things that happen, all of the things that we encounter in this life, and we know that we can trust you with our destination for the life to come. We know and we trust that you will redeem us, that you will redeem this world, and ultimately, God, you're going to make all things new and good. So with that in mind, God, it's, it's in the name of Jesus, the powerful and the awesome and mighty name that we pray. Amen.